Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, April 4th, 2024. President Joe Biden speaks by phone with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, their first since an Israeli strike killed World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza. President Biden says U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will depend on Israel taking specific and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. NATO celebrates its 75th anniversary, and the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs speaks to a NATO-Ukraine Council meeting at NATO headquarters in Brussels about the increasingly dire situation facing the Ukrainian military in its ongoing war against Russia without more Western military aid. Biden administration issues a final rule to make it harder to remove career federal employees in response to former President Donald Trump's proposed changes to root out what he calls the deep state. We'll talk about it with Federal News Network reporter Drew Friedman. EPA Administrator Michael Regan and Vice President Kamala Harris announced $20 billion for clean energy project financing. They were in Charlotte, North Carolina. White House responds to a report the administration is trying to get major employers in Baltimore to commit to protecting jobs after that bridge collapse and port closure has disrupted the economy. And a wreath-laying ceremony at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center in Atlanta on this anniversary of the 1968 assassination of Dr. King. Story from CNN, President Joe Biden on Thursday told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the overall humanitarian situation in Gaza is unacceptable and warned Israel to take steps to address the crisis or face consequences, a stark statement from Israel's staunchest ally. The conversation was the two leaders' first phone call since an Israeli strike killed seven aid workers from the World Central Kitchen who were working in Gaza. That incident has sent off furor inside the White House, and Biden has been described as reaching a new level of frustration with Israel's campaign in Gaza. That was the reporting from CNN. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke about the call at a news conference at NATO headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, where he's attending a NATO minister's conference. This week's horrific attack on the World Central Kitchen was not the first such incident. It must be the last. President Biden spoke a short while ago with Prime Minister Netanyahu. The leaders discussed the situation in Gaza. The president emphasized that the strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation are unacceptable. He made clear the need for Israel to announce a series of specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian uh, suffering, and the safety of aid workers. He made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. He underscored as well that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians and he urged Prime Minister Netanyahu to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay to bring the hostages home. The two leaders also discussed public Iranian threats against Israel and the Israeli people. President Biden reaffirmed the United States' strong support for Israel in the face of these threats and our commitment to Israel's security. Right now, there is no higher priority in Gaza than protecting civilians, surging humanitarian assistance, and ensuring the security of those who provide it. Israel must meet this moment. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at NATO headquarters in Brussels. An Associated Press article about the phone call between the leaders begins, President Joe Biden told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday that future U.S. support for the Gaza war depends on new steps to protect civilians and aid workers. The exact words in the White House readout of the call are, President Biden made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. At the White House news conference in Washington, D.C., John Kirby, National Security Communications Advisor, was asked by a reporter what that means. In your readout, when you say the president made clear that the U.S. that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action, could you decode that for us? What exactly is the warning that's being issued here? I think it's very clear in the language itself, uh, Nancy. Um, we're going to the we're looking for concrete steps to alleviate humanitarian suffering in Gaza. 
Again, I won't get ahead of what the Israelis will or won't say or announce. We're looking for concrete steps to be announced here soon. Um, and it's not just about the announcement of concrete steps and changes in their policies, but it's the execution of those announcements and those decisions and implementing them. Uh, and so we're, we obviously will will watch closely and monitor uh, how how they do on, on the commitments that they make. And as um, as I said earlier, if there's no changes to their policy and their approaches, then there's going to have to be changes to ours. I think, I think what the world wants to understand is, is the White House warning that it may remove military aid? What exactly is the threat here? I think I've... I've uh, stated it pretty clearly, uh, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to, as I said earlier, I'm not going to preview steps. I'm not going to preview decisions that haven't been made yet. But um, there are things that need to be done. There are too many civilians being killed. The risk to aid workers is unacceptable. Uh, now we have certain aid organizations that are reconsidering whether they're even going to be able to continue operations in Gaza while famine looms. So there has to be tangible steps. Let's see what they announce. Let's see what they direct. Let's see what they do. Uh, but I'm not going to get ahead of that. Good, Mary. So, I, I'm going to try this one more time because the president. I reckon you seems, would. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do. The president seems to have said to, to the prime minister today, you know, make these concrete changes or else. It's the or else that I want to make clear here. Is the president threatening to withhold aid to Israel if they do not make these changes? The president made it clear that our policies with respect to Gaza uh, will be dependent upon our assessment of how well the Israelis uh, make changes and implement changes uh, to, to make the situation in Gaza better for the Palestinian people. And how much time are you giving them to make these changes, to implement these concrete steps? Again, we, we would hope to see some announcements of changes here in coming hours and days, and I'll leave it at that. That's short. Hours and days. John Kirby, White House National Security Communications Advisor, taking reporters' questions in the White House briefing room. A Reuters article quotes Israeli government spokesperson Raquela Karamson about the Israeli strike on the World Central Kitchen humanitarian aid convoy that killed seven workers, including an American, saying this was unattended. Clearly something went wrong here. And as we learn more and the investigation reveals exactly what happened and the cause of what happened, we will certainly adjust our practice in the future to make sure this does not happen again. Back in the U.S., at the Pentagon, the press secretary Pat Ryder said that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke by phone to Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant. Secretary Austin spoke by phone yesterday with Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant. The two leaders continued their regular dialogue on U.S. and Israeli efforts to ensure the defeat of Hamas and secure the release of all hostages. As was highlighted in our readout last night, Secretary Austin expressed his outrage at the Israeli strike Tuesday on a World Central Kitchen humanitarian aid convoy that killed seven aid workers, including an American citizen. Secretary Austin stressed the need to immediately take concrete steps to protect aid workers and Palestinian civilians in Gaza after repeated coordination failures with foreign aid groups. Secretary Austin also urged Minister Gallant to conduct a swift and transparent investigation into this incident to share their conclusions publicly, and to hold those responsible to account. Additionally, Secretary Austin again raised the need for a rapid increase of aid coming through all crossings in the coming days, particularly to communities in northern Gaza that are at risk of famine. During the call, the Secretary also reiterated U.S. support for Israel's defense against a range of regional threats. A full readout is available on defense.gov. The Pentagon Press Secretary Pat Ryder, an Air Force Major General at today's Pentagon News Conference. Former President Donald Trump, a Republican presidential candidate, was asked about the war between Israel and Hamas during an interview today with radio show host Hugh Hewitt, specifically about his comments in an interview last weekend when he urged Israel to accomplish their goals quickly. But October 7th would have never happened. They never, ever would have been attacked. But it is what it is, and this horrible thing happened. And what I said very plainly is, get it over with and let's get back to peace and stop killing people. And that's a very simple statement, get it over with. They gotta finish what they finish, they just have to get it done. Get it over with and get it over with fast because we have to, you have to get back to normalcy and peace. The whole world is blowing up with this idiot president we have. He's an idiot. He's, he's the dumbest president we've ever had. 
He's the most corrupt and he's the most incompetent. And he's the worst president we've ever had by a fact. You know, I say, and you've listened to plenty of them, if you add up the 10 worst presidents in history, they haven't done the damage that this guy's done to our country. What he's done at the border with allowing probably 15 million people by this time into our country and plenty more coming, uh, it's just insane. What, what they have done to our country in three and a half years is unbelievable. But you are still standing 100% with Israel. You, you achieved the Abraham Accords, which was the first peace deal since right. Sadat. And so are you still 100% with Israel? And what's your advice to Netanyahu beyond get it over with in a hurry? Well, that's all the advice you can give. I mean, that's the advice. You've got to get it over with, and you have to get back to normalcy. And I'm not sure that I'm loving the way they're doing it because you got to have victory. You have to have a victory. And it's taking a, a long time. And the other thing is I hate they put out tapes all the time. Every night they're releasing tapes of a building falling down. They shouldn't be releasing tapes like that. They're doing that's why they're losing the PR war. They, Israel is absolutely losing the PR war. Former President Donald Trump on the Hugh Hewitt radio show. He is a Republican presidential candidate. NBC News has a story. Human Rights Watch released a report today accusing the Israeli military of an apparent war crime in striking a residential building with seemingly no military target. The strike in question was on a residential building south of a refugee camp on October 31st and killed at least 106 civilians, more than half of which were children according to Human Rights Watch. A note about the presidential election in the United States this year. The group No Labels out with a statement that it is ending our effort to put forth the unity ticket in the 2024 presidential election. The press release goes on. Americans remain more open to an independent presidential run and hungrier for unifying national leadership than ever before. But No Labels has always said we would only offer our ballot line to a ticket if we could identify candidates with a credible path to winning the White House. No such candidate emerged. So the responsible course of action is for us to stand down. A Wall Street Journal article about this says that Nancy Jacobson, No Label's founder and CEO, told supporters that the organization had reached out to 30 potential candidates during its process and that No Labels has said it has secured ballot access in 19 states, including the battleground states of Arizona, Nevada, and North Carolina. This is Washington Today. From Associated Press, NATO marked on Thursday 75 years of collective defense across Europe and North America, with its top diplomats vowing to stay the course in Ukraine as better armed Russian troops assert control on the battlefield. The anniversary comes as the now 32-nation alliance weighs a plan to provide more predictable, longer-term military support to Ukraine. Plagued by ammunition shortages, Ukraine this week lowered its military conscription age from 27 to 25 in an effort to replenish its depleted ranks and appealed for additional air defenses to counter Russian ballistic missile attacks. That was from AP. Back to Secretary of State Antony Blinken at his news conference at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Now here in Brussels, uh, we marked 75 years to the day since the founding of the NATO alliance. We had our first ministerial meeting with Sweden at the table, a full ally. There are now 32 members of the NATO alliance. And that alliance has continued to adapt, to meet challenges, to meet threats as they've emerged. So while we focused on celebrating uh, the fact that we've hit the 75-year mark, we're intensely focused on the future. We discussed concrete outcomes for the upcoming Washington summit in July, including increasing our support for Ukraine, strengthening uh, NATO's deterrence and defense posture, in particular through boosting our defense industrial bases on both sides of the Atlantic, and deepening cooperation with partners including from the Indo-Pacific. We also held our second NATO-Ukraine Council. We reaffirmed that Ukraine's future is in NATO. Our goal now is to create a bridge to Ukraine's full membership, offering additional support and greater cooperation as Ukraine makes the reforms necessary to join the alliance. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at a news conference at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Earlier in the day, he and the Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitro Kuleba spoke to the press after the NATO-Ukraine Council meeting. Here's the foreign minister. I didn't want to spoil the birthday party for NATO, but uh, I felt compelled 
to deliver a very sobering message on behalf of Ukrainians about the state of uh, Russian air attacks on my country, destroying our energy system, our economy, killing civilians. And I urged allies today to provide Ukraine with uh, new additional air defense systems, uh, the best of which is Patriot. This is the only system that effectively intercepts uh, um, ballistic missiles. In March only, Ukraine uh, suffered from 94 ballistic missiles. 94 ballistic missiles were shot at Ukraine. As a result of the discussions that we had and the strong encouraging messages from, from Secretary Blinken, allies will undertake an exercise of um, allocating or finding this, uh, identifying these additional uh, air defense systems in order to bring them to Ukraine, to provide them to Ukraine and uh, uh, help defend our skies. Of course, uh, I also listened carefully to the uh, discussion to the comments related to the upcoming Washington summit. It is up for to up to allies themselves to decide uh, on the form and the content of the next step towards Ukraine's membership in NATO. I understand that decision has been taken today to task uh, the military military part of the alliance with designing what that step could be. And we will be looking forward to the outcome, but uh, of course we believe that Ukraine deserves to be a member of NATO and that this should happen sooner rather, sooner, sooner rather than later. So uh, we will be looking forward to the uh, outcome of these uh, deliberations. Finally, I would like to thank the people of the United States and the Biden administration and those forces in Congress who work tirelessly on finding a solution to a very to a problem that seems to be very simple, just put something to the vote, mm. put the law to the vote. No one has doubts that the law will be voted by overwhelming majority, but overcoming this last obstacle is uh, crucial. It has to happen as soon as possible. We heard the latest messages coming from Washington, and we hope that this will be delivered. The Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Kuleba, making a public statement standing beside Secretary of State Antony Blinken at NATO headquarters in Brussels, Belgium. An article from Reuters, Russia and NATO are now in direct confrontation, the Kremlin said, as the U.S.-led alliance marked its 75th anniversary on Thursday. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told reporters, in fact, relations have now slipped to the level of direct confrontation. NATO, he says, has already in involved in the conflict surrounding Ukraine and continues to move towards our borders and expand its military infrastructure towards our borders. That story from Reuters. And at NATO headquarters in Belgium, the Belgian military band playing at the official ceremony to celebrate NATO's 75 years. One of the speakers, Admiral Rob Bauer from the Netherlands, he chairs the NATO military committee. On this day, 75 years ago, NATO allies signed a treaty to create a band of brothers and sisters. Starting with 12, we have now grown into an alliance of 32 armed forces. Each word of the Washington Treaty lying here before me is a sacred pledge that allied armed forces fight to uphold. Together, we are protecting much more than physical safety. We are collectively defending freedom and democracy. The choice to put your life in the service of freedom comes from a deep-rooted desire to be part of something bigger, to be there for others, to fight for the we in a world of me. When civilians seek shelter, military personnel step up. We are the shield for the innocent. We are what stands between freedom and oppression. That task, that life goal, is something that all men and women in uniform share with each other. It forms an invisible bond that transcends wars and generations. It is a bond you can feel, because you know what it means to serve. Prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice. That bond, that boundless trust, is something all Allied Armed Forces share. We feel the security of comradeship, the security of friendship. 
Across Europe and North America, three and a half million men and women in uniform are upholding a shield against aggression. We deter and defend against any adversary at any time in any place. In a world where authoritarian regimes are desperately trying to portray an image of strength and brutal tyranny strives to take away the sovereign rights of peoples and nations, we need that shield more than ever. We need to show the world that democracy is worth fighting for. Admiral Rob Bauer, chair of the NATO Military Committee at today's ceremony in Brussels. In Washington, the Atlantic Council held a discussion about the 75th anniversary of NATO. The panelists included Ian Brzezinski, who served in the Defense Department in the George W. Bush administration, and Paul Dobryansky, who was in the State Department during that presidency. First, Ian Brzezinski, former Deputy Assistant Defense Secretary for Europe and NATO. 75 years is a long period of time. That alone testifies to the success of the alliance, you know, growing from 12 original signatories that signed the document here in Washington to now 32. What NATO does is it serves as the institutional core of this transatlantic community of democracies. And it was established to mobilize and orchestrate the combined political, economic, and military power of, of these democracies. And it has done that with, with great effect. I mean, what NATO is known first and foremost for is its role as a military institution, something, an organization that can throw lead downrange effectively to deter our adversaries and, when necessary, defeat them. And in this regard, the alliance has been history's most successful alliance. It enabled NATO, uh, the transatlantic community, to win the Cold War without firing a shot. It brought peace to the Balkans. I've seen, you've seen, my colleagues have seen firsthand um, allied forces operating, sometimes under, under the NATO flag in Afghanistan or in, 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 in Iraq. Their interoperability, their effectiveness, their courage rooted uh, in the camaraderie and collectiveness fostered through NATO. And its alliance is backed by $55 trillion in GDP. Uh, that's almost half, if not more than half, of global GDP. That's a lot of weight. It's 10, ten times that of, of, of Russia, more than twice that of China. And then also, it's backed by the political legitimacy that comes from a community of democracy. I believe that's a real force multiplier. It's a message to our adversaries. It's a motivator for our troops. So these military, economic, and ideological advantages are exactly what NATO brings to the table, and they're important in an age, as Jenna pointed out, of increasing complexity, increasing danger and lethality uh, in, in the battle space that our armed forces have to operate in. Ian Brzezinski, former Deputy Assistant Defense Secretary for Europe and NATO in the George W. Bush administration, today at the Atlantic Council in Washington, a panel discussion about NATO's 75th anniversary, which is today. Also taking part, Paula Dobryansky, who was Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs in the George W. Bush presidency. What are the some of the challenges and accomplishments? I look back. Let's not take it for granted. Ian just mentioned we were first at 12 when it was signed in as the North Atlantic Treaty, and now 32. So one of the challenges at the time was the question about expansion and enlargement. And there were many debates and discussions about it. And by the way, if you ask me at this time, in my lifetime, would I have ever expected Finland or Sweden to become members, you know? Um, I, I, I really wasn't sure that that would happen in my own lifetime, and here we are. It's not just only the expansion of those core members, but also if you look at it in terms of the number of the NATO non-members across the globe, which is also a very significant attachment and investment to the very purpose of the alliance as you laid out. So one was the whole question of enlargement itself, which has, I think, really moved forward rather thoughtfully and strategically and successfully. And then there's the issue of burden sharing. And I think we'll dive a little bit more into that. But let me at least say that. That's been the question of you know, what uh, member states put into it. I'll just come fast forward. I think that given the kinds of discussions and debates that have taken place, I look at where we are now. Over half of the members are, are investing over 2% uh, at a minimum and even over. I'll single out, we had recently 
the foreign minister of Poland, Radek Sikorski, who was here speaking at the council. He mentioned the fact that Poland is putting 4% of its GDP and challenging other countries as NATO members. So this has been an issue, but I think it has moved substantially and significantly in the right direction, where it's a shared and it is burden sharing. Let me mention just another, and that is, I remember the big debates about out of area, and NATO was focused on just the region for all the reasons that Ian stated. And then the question was, well, should it have a role in other places? Afghanistan was one of the ones that loomed large years back. And so here we are at this time, I'm very struck by the fact that uh, Jen Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, actually has been speaking to the issue about the threat from the Indo-Pacific. Here he's referring to China in particular and what role NATO should have in that regard. To me, that's also a real mark of success. The fact that it has been so unified and successful in terms of the region, but it is looking at what role it can play beyond. So that that was a challenge before, and now it's one that actually it really presents engagement. And it's a question before NATO and for the future, and I think we'll dive into that also in our discussion, what form that will take, what does that actually mean for, for NATO. I'll conclude on this. It's just on the occasion of this anniversary. I was very struck by the fact that Stoltenberg, in releasing the annual report of NATO, he mentioned all the kinds of challenges that that are confronting the global community at this time. And he said, but you know what? I'm proud of the fact that we're a stronger alliance. And actually, because of these very challenges, we have become a stronger alliance, even from what we were at the beginning. Paula Dobryansky, former Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs in the George W. Bush administration today at the Atlantic Council, a discussion about NATO's 75th anniversary, which is today. A statue of former President Harry Truman cast at a foundry in Oklahoma was installed at the residence of the U.S. ambassador to NATO in Brussels yesterday as part of this anniversary. Truman was president in 1949 when the NATO treaty was signed. And in attendance to, for the unveiling, Truman's eldest grandson, Clifton Truman Daniel. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there. I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app, which is free. The Environmental Protection Agency, writes the Washington Post, on Thursday awarded $20 billion to help finance clean energy projects across the country, marking one of the Biden administration's biggest investments in combating climate change and curbing pollution in disadvantaged communities. The money comes from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund established by President Biden's signature climate law, the Inflation Reduction Act. The fund seeks to leverage public and private dollars to invest in clean energy technologies such as solar panels, heat pumps, and more. The EPA is awarding money to eight nonprofits who have committed to leverage nearly $7 in private capital for every $1 of federal investment. That was from the Washington Post. The EPA Administrator Michael Regan joined Vice President Kamala Harris today in Charlotte, North Carolina, to make these announcements of these federal Green Bank grants. Here is Administrator Regan. EPA was bestowed the honor of implementing and executing a $27 billion, folks, that's billion with a B, 
Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, known to us nerds as GGRF. <laughs> yes. Now listen, this fund is designed to pull hundreds of billions of dollars of private capital off the sidelines to address climate change head on, to reinforce our country's economic competitiveness, to lower energy costs for everyday families, and to increase economic revitalization all across our great nation. So today, we are introducing to the world eight applicants who will receive awards totaling $20 billion across two of the GGRF grant competitions. The National Clean Investment Fund and the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, with their help and their leadership, EPA is creating a first-of-its-kind national network of community-led financial institutions that will support climate and clean energy projects, especially in communities that need it the most. By building the capacity of hundreds of community lenders, these investments will drive deployment of tens of thousands of clean technology projects that will reduce pollution and, again, save people money. And the good news is we are not starting from scratch because these applicants are not new to this work. These experts have already provided capital to families and small businesses all across the country, like a pizza restaurant in Detroit, Michigan, to access more energy efficient lighting and water fixtures, as well as solar panels to reduce those overhead costs, which is helping to keep that restaurant's doors open. They supported community lenders across the country like a Latino-led CDFI that is deploying or developing a 99-unit affordable housing project in Chicago to maximize energy efficiency, reduce pollution, and save on energy cost. The EPA Administrator Michael Regan, along with Vice President Kamala Harris, today in Charlotte, North Carolina. The nonprofits have also pledged to ensure that at least 70 percent of the funds will benefit disadvantaged communities. A New York Times article on this, Republicans have slammed the money as a green doggle and said that the EPA is not prepared to oversee such a large program. House Republicans passed a bill in March that would repeal the greenhouse gas reduction program. President Biden threatened to veto the measure if it were to reach his desk, and it has not come up for a vote in the Senate. From Bloomberg News, President Biden's advisors have called major Baltimore employers, including Amazon.com, Inc. and Home Depot, Inc., to encourage them to retain jobs despite the bridge collapse that shut the city's port. According to people familiar with the matter, White House Press Secretary Crean Jean-Pierre was asked about this today. There's a report from Bloomberg that the White House, specifically Jeff Zients and Will Brainerd, are calling um, major Baltimore employers, including Amazon and Home Depot, encouraging them to not cut jobs in the wake of the bridge collapse. Um, Can you confirm that that outreach is happening and other outreach like that? And what is the message from the administration to those big companies? So a couple of things that, uh, uh, and I think I've read this out before, that we have been doing as it relates to supply chain and the potential economic impact. (laughs) Uh, The President's Supply Chain Distribution Task Force has convened multiple times at this point uh, to analyze the impact of supply chain, which has so far been manageable, which is important. The task force worked with railroads to set up new service lines and with ports and ocean carriers to divert vessels. Uh, The SBA, the Small Business Administration, has made low interest disaster loan assistance available to eligible businesses and set up business recovery centers to help on the ground as it relates to your question about Chief, the Chief, Chief of Staff Zients and other senior uh, White House officials. Uh, they have had, uh, they have called uh, major employers in the Baltimore area, including retail chains and distributors, to encourage them to retain workers. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we're having those important conversations for the people of Baltimore, obviously. <laughs> They're also working with SBA to reach out to small businesses and are in touch with local unions alongside the Labor Department as well. So we're going to do everything we can uh, to have these conversations with stakeholders uh, so that we can identify any uh, and address any potential disruptions. Uh, and so we, if anything, this should show that this is an administration that's being active and we're being um, uh, proactive of obviously, uh, in trying to make sure that uh, that uh, we deal with any potential economic impact. Right now, as I said at the top, we see this being manageable, uh, and this is why the, these, um, these conversations are critical with stakeholders. 
The White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre at her news conference at the White House. President Joe Biden is scheduled to visit Baltimore in the site of the collapsed bridge and closed port on Friday. From Yahoo Finance, stocks slumped on Thursday as oil hit its highest price in six months and a key Federal Reserve official floated a warning that interest rate cuts might not come in 2024. And the Dow was down 530 points, NASDAQ down 228, S&P down 64. The Biden administration has issued a final rule designed to protect many federal civil service workers from being reclassified as political appointees and therefore subject to easier removal from their jobs, as former President Donald Trump wanted to do and may try again if he's reelected. Drew Friedman, a reporter with Federal News Network, joined us now on the phone. Thanks for being with us. What's in this new rule? So the new rule, this is from the Office of Personnel Management, essentially the HR agency for the federal workforce. And it essentially accomplishes three key things. The first is that it confirms that federal employees cannot have their civil service protections removed without their consent. Second, if there are cases where employees are seeing their rights uh, removed or some of these worker protections taken away, they will have an appeals process that they can complete to push back against that. And then third, it clarifies that the specific types of positions that former President Trump was targeting in his original executive order back in 2020, those positions now, according to the final rule, are um are political positions and cannot be applied to career or non-political federal employees. How many federal workers fall into each of these categories or could potentially? The numbers are unclear largely because the Schedule F executive order came very late in the Trump administration and it was overturned within just a couple of months by President Biden. So it was never actually implemented, and we can only have estimates or guesses for how much or how broadly this would have impacted federal employees. Generally, the estimate is about 50,000 workers. These would be uh, career employees in policy-related positions. However, there have been some documents from the uh, Trump administration's Office of Management and Budget that have recently shown that it could have been much broader if it was implemented up to a couple hundred thousand federal employees who may have been impacted by Schedule F at that time. President Biden put out a statement saying the rule is a step toward combating corruption and partisan interference to ensure civil servants are able to focus on the most important task at hand, delivering for the American people. Republican Congressman James Comer said the rule allows poor performing federal workers and those who attempt to thwart the policies of a duly elected president to remain entrenched in the federal bureaucracy. These seem to be very different interpretations of what's happening here. Is there any middle ground? There is. Uh, Thank you for bringing that up. There is this middle ground idea that, yes, there may be a need for civil service reform. So the way that the federal workforce operates now, uh, some in the, the middle arena think that there should be larger conversations that address Uh, performance management, the accountability of federal employees to, at the end of the day, ensure that federal services and customer service to the American public uh, is operating as effectively as it can be. So I think there is this conversation more broadly of what that could look like and what types of civil service reform there need to be. But those in the middle uh, arena, not those who align with the uh, Schedule F attempts or those who are largely against it, but those in the middle believe, you know, this is this is something that would be important uh, to accomplish uh, in the long term. We're talking with Drew Friedman, reporter with Federal News Network. Some news articles are saying that the Biden administration move is to prevent a return to Schedule F. But procedurally, could this rule be undone by another rule under President Trump? The short answer is yes. However, you have certainly Biden administration officials who are saying that this is the strongest action that the administration could feasibly take Uh, in terms of the executive branch's powers. The regulatory process, this is the process that agencies use to interpret 
uh, or in some cases issue regulations over the laws that we have. And in theory, however, the the because the Biden administration went through that regulatory process to come to these new uh, protections or clarifying these protections for federal employees, that that same uh, procedure could apply to a future administration who may want to reverse that. And I think you, some experts will say that it would certainly become more complicated. It's a little bit um, more stringent, for example, than an executive order, which can be uh, signed and then rescinded very quickly. The regulatory process typically takes six months to a year. So uh, I think you have some belief that even though this is offering better protections, better job protections for civil servants, it's certainly not the end of the road or a full block, so to say, on Schedule F's return. And finally, this is a final rule. When does it take effect? It will take effect in early May. It's being published to the Federal Register just this week, and we will see it uh, take effect in about a month. Drew Friedman, reporter with Federal News Network. You can find her articles at federalnewsnetwork.com and on X at D Friedman WFED. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. From the Associated Press, Jill Biden has new guidance for the nation's top teachers. When they visit the White House later this year, they will be the guests of honor at a state dinner, the first time that the diplomatic nicety typically used to woo foreign heads of state or government will honor educators. According to the First Lady, a teacher herself, Jill Biden made the announcement Wednesday during a nationally televised appearance in which she surprised Missy Testerman of Tennessee, the newly named National Teacher of the Year. An article from the Associated Press and the two were on CBS Mornings on Wednesday. Well, I'm a teacher, as you well know, and I've been teaching uh, over 30 years, just like Missy has. And uh, I always say teachers are our heroes. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be here today to celebrate Missy, as I love celebrating teachers. And I have a special announcement, Missy. Oh, wow. When you come to the White House, we are going to have a state dinner for the teachers. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank, you. So Thank you so much. You'll have to pick your dress. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Let's do some thinking on that. <laughs> so it's the first That's time wonderful. ever. So. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say, have you ever deal. done that before? Yeah. No, it's never yeah. been done and we want to I wonder whose idea that was. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder whose idea that was. First Lady Jill Biden and Teacher of the Year Missy Testerman on CBS Mornings on Wednesday. A Politico article says that the First Lady did not announce a date for the teachers' dinner, but it's likely to be held May 1st when the teachers come to Washington, a White House official said. This little light of mine, say, I'm gonna let it shine, please say, this Family members of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. leading a group song at a wreath laying at the crypt of the King Center Freedom Plaza in Atlanta on this 56th anniversary of his assassination. Bernice King, the CEO of the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change, said at today's ceremony that his message endures. We are here united as a family to let you know that we are going to continue these great legacies uh, of our parents um, as, as we stand here uh, as a family honoring the legacy of my father, and especially in these times, as we know, uh, the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Mrs. Coretta Scott King are so critical to the times that we're living in. Very turbulent, troubling, difficult, challenging times. Uh, But Dr. King gave us a way. He gave us a philosophy and a methodology uh, to transform this world. And we believe here at the King Center that if more people would study Kingian nonviolence, and then practice Kingian nonviolence, as Dr. King told us um, in his Nobel Peace Prize lecture, that I suggest that the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence immediately become a subject of study in every field of human conflict, by no means excluding relations between nations. We believe that if more and more people would study it and put it into practice in everyday life, to deal with not just our societal issues because much of what happens in society spills out from our very hearts. You know, out of the heart flow the issues of life. And and so as 
Kenya and nonviolence transforms us, we transform and change the way society looks. So if we want a peaceful society, then nonviolence is the pathway to creating that peace and the pathway to creating the beloved community. Bernice King, CEO of the King Center in Atlanta at today's ceremony at the burial site of Dr. King and his wife, Coretta Scott King, on this 56th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. A story from Axios reads that family members of the late Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. will make a rare visit to Memphis, where the civil rights leader was assassinated on Thursday to mark the 56th anniversary of his murder, the King family tells Axios. King family members say they're going to Memphis to draw attention to what they see as a rising threat of political violence today. That was from Axios. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up to get C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and we'll deliver the stories making headlines in Washington to your inbox every day. Subscribe at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.